Okay, um, let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of uh, the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies here at Mason, uh, the program in Global Affairs, and the College of Magic and Social Sciences, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion of um, Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, I think as we talked about putting this together with the anxiety and the fear, uh, we wanted to have a discussion with our community, with our group, Mason. Uh, about these events. Um, we're really glad to welcome those of you who are here in person. I know we have a lot of people that are joining us online. Um, we want to specifically welcome the members of Mason's Pi Gamma Mu National Honor Society who are joining us today. Um, I'll just say a couple of words to start. Um, on February 24th, as you know, after weeks of lies about his intentions, uh, Vladimir Putin launched an unprovoked full scale invasion of Ukraine extending a war that had been ongoing already since 2014, uh, when Russia occupied Crimea, and when Russia was involved in a war in the eastern Ukrainian regions of Luhansk and Donetsk that had in the past eight years taken over 14,000 lives. Falsifying centuries of history, denying the Ukrainian identity and claiming that Ukrainians and Russians are a single people, denying the right of Ukrainian people to their own state and their own government, Spurlessly accusing all Ukrainian nationalists and the current Ukrainian government in particular as Nazis and claiming it was engaged in genocide, who launched a massive invasion of Ukraine. The Ukrainian army has proven remarkably resilient and its president heroic, uh, but they and their country are still in peril. People are dying in large numbers, and our worst fears are that the killing has only just begun. Uh, some 2 million people have already fled Ukraine as refugees. Millions more are in bomb shelters trying to protect their families. Meanwhile, Putin has virtually declared war on the Russian population as well, cutting off access to sources of independent information, criminalizing not only dissent, but even speaking honestly about the war, a war that nobody is allowed to call a war, for fear of a possible 15-year prison. So, we want to talk about what's happened. Um, there are many things to talk about, and many questions I think for us to try to answer. Um, but I also want to say that I'm going to come at this from a point of view. Uh, I'm a specialist in Soviet history. I teach about Ukrainian history as part of that mandate, but I don't teach it more specifically in Ukrainian history. My research has been in Russia and in Kazakhstan, not in Ukraine. I speak Russian, not Ukrainian. We offer at Mason courses in the Russian language, but not in the Ukrainian language. And all of these factors are themselves part of the imperial structure that lays behind these events. Uh, so tonight, we'll try to amplify Ukrainian voices where we can. Uh, and we'll try to be cognizant not only of what we know, but also of what we don't. Uh, we have brought together a wide array of scholars to broaden our discussion but it will necessarily be incomplete. Uh, and it's just part of ongoing discussions that must happen that includes a discussion that happened last night with faculty from Charlotte School at Mason. And I want to point you in particular to an event tomorrow organized by the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution and led by our colleague who's here with us tonight, Karina Porcelina. Uh, this event will bring together Ukrainian scholars and experts on Zoom to continue the discussion. It's at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, you can easily, for those who are here in person, find a link uh, to information about this and registration for this event. You go to russianstudies.gmu.tu, there's a link there. Uh, but we'll also put uh, a link in the Q&A section for our online audience, so you can attend that event tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to introduce Linda Colton, uh, who's assistant professor in the program in global affairs, and who's going to host our discussion tonight. Uh, and we'll introduce to our first speaker. Well, uh, thank you, and, and once uh, when we just got a second, uh, uh, thanks for all of you for attending, either in person or virtually. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, as uh, so you know, who, who's who, both in person and uh, online. Uh, so I have Elena, and I apologize if I also get the language straight, because yeah. I speak yeah. Russian or Ukrainian. Um, so Elena is instructor of Russian language in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages at George Mason. And she has taught Russian for 14 years. 
They have uh, Karina Bertolina, originally from Ukraine, who is professor and director of the Peace Lab on reconciling conflict in individual divisions of the Carter School. Um, Garrett Mason, and she conducts research on identity based conflicts around the world with special emphasis on Ukraine. The results of her research are supported by 54 grants and 93 articles and 16 books. Uh, Matthew Mangle is a postdoctoral fellow in Russian literature and culture. One of his primary focuses is on, the, is on integrating contemporary Russian media and culture into language and literature classrooms to build intercultural competency. He's currently teaching a course at Mason entitled Contemporary Russian Media and Culture, Diversity and Disinformation, which examines the relation between Russia's global disinformation campaigns and its repression of diversity in political and social lives. Eric Shrev is a political, uh, political psychologist and author who has been teaching base for 20 years. He is currently head of ARC, a research lab to study, to study reputational politics, and he has written and taught broadly on the Russian political system. Uh, Vadim Stackel will be monitoring our webinar this evening and uh, choosing questions submitted by the online audience to post to the panelists. He's a faculty member of the Department of History and Art History here at Nathan and was the editor of Yale University's press publications on the history of Stalinism, lead on its Stalin digital archive project. And at Mason has worked on an important digital, digital repository and scholarly community post on the history of Islam in Russia and the Soviet Union. And uh, then last but not least, uh, Marina, uh, Mariana Verbosia, who is an environmental, environmental journalist with 10 years of experience in traditional and online media communications, environmental and human rights activism. And she's currently a Fulbright Fellow at George Mason at the Department of Communication. And I'm not really a panelist, as, as Steve said, I'm in the Global Affairs Program. Uh, I, work, I don't work in this part of the world. I, I work on small arms and human rights. But if those questions come up, I'm happy to come up to as needed, and also uh, if you come up about more than Europe and the American voices. So, with the twin goals of amplifying the Ukrainian voices and ensuring plenty of time for conversation rather than lectures, we're going to ask our two Ukrainian colleagues to each open up our discussion, and then we will turn to our audience questions. And online participants can submit questions to the general Q and A feature, and we will start with um, Marianne Herbovic for it work. Uh, I'm so sorry, but we could not really hear you no, because it's the same as other participants. Sound. Yeah. Maybe you need to be close to microphone because there are a lot of online participants. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm really sorry because we, Eric and me, we really see that it's, we could not hear anything and it's very important. Can we do something about that? Not just for us, it's important for everyone who is online. Sorry. We, Steve, we hear you so well. Steve, clear, sound yeah. clear, clear and loud. So here in the USA, I work with my research about climate change communication. I'm glad that you feel the same. And I'm so honored to be among you and have a basic opportunity. It's a real privilege to me. But I couldn't imagine that this fellowship would give me not just only professional development, but also to save my cellular life in this heartbreaking event in Ukraine. And I couldn't imagine that my homeland would be attacked by someone who pretends fighting with neo Nazis. So 
So let me say a few words about my background. Uh, my background is farming, actually. And I do know a lot about agriculture. But there is one more reason um, why I am so motivated to spread information about the environment. I was born less than 100 miles from Chernobyl, the years after it exploded. And um, usually kids from this library had their checkup uh, like two or three times per year. And our doctors uh, tried to cheer us up with slow quality jokes, like you should have superpower or everything is possible if you were born near Chernobyl. And to be honest, I'm so exhausted with this rhetoric playing with the quick pulling about Chernobyl. But even now, when we talk about war, about Russian war in Ukraine, the language matter, it matters, it's not like Ukrainian crisis, it's real war. So even now, when we talk about Russian war in Ukraine, we still talk about Chernobyl. And I thought it would be like, the biggest Ukrainian drama ever, and but today we see that it's not. So you uh, might have known that this region has a border with Belarus, so people are not safe, they're like all Ukrainians. And um, you might have heard that Russia occupied Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and you might be wondering why, because, because we just can't step back. It's like fighting from the church, which is me, of course. And I remember that it was a third or fourth day of the war, and I called to my mom because my parents still live there. And she, of course, they very refused to, to admire, to accept this reality. And my mom told me, said me, I'm so worried that you would be unlike from the other city. And I said to my mom, why? I mean, what is the real question about that recently? And she said, because we have so much meat in my food. Oh. This is everything you should know about my parents. They try to cheer up to me even from Ukraine, but I am safe here and they are not. Of course, if uh, we, we try to find something to smile, but this is the final times for Ukraine as bombs rain down on cities. And I'm sure that I will remember the first day or the end of my life. It made my life into before and after. It was like 1 a.m. here, and my son asked for a cup of water. We went to the kitchen, and I found my husband was left home. He was very calm and whispered it's nothing. It's hard to describe what I feel now because it's like a new reality for all of us. My husband is a journalist and he works with Ukrainian media outlet. He sleeps like three or four hours per day because he tried to be important for Ukrainians. I think a lot of Ukrainians, especially if you are feel guilty that we are not with Ukrainians now, but that we can find, like, we can help directly. And our hometown is Lviv, which is very close to the Polish border. And Poland opened the border to Ukrainians immediately after the start of Russian full scale invasion. And as you say, for more than two million Ukrainians left country. This is Europe's worst refugee crisis since World War II. And it wasn't easy uh, to cross the border, even with open borders. I mean, people stood for the more, than 20, more than 35 hours in a mile long line. A lot of them traveled with food, with kids, pets, and elders reached the border. And February is the coldest month in Ukraine. It ejected in Ukraine to be very angry, furious. Just imagine that people should have stood on the street with kids without food, without roof, without any chairs, but the temperature was around 23 Fahrenheit. And my best friend couldn't cross 
what the border because man and I cannot to leave the country. The gradient men aged 18 to 60 have been banned from leaving the country and urged to join the army. From my very close friend in Yugoslavia with her three-year-old son, my godson, decided to stay with her husband. And she said it was the harder decision in her life. Even if you leave on the territories, there are no Russian attack yet. You are not safe. There are also no signs that they, my friend and family, hear sirens. The sound of sirens warning the air raid from the city. People should hide in the basement or even in underground metro station. It's scary that seeking shelter and rolling out sirens has become a part of daily life. The sound is designed to terrify you, to let you not take action. If it were a pleasant sounding or a different frequency of volume, you wouldn't pay any attention. And now imagine that you should live with this sound through the day, with your kids, with your family. In addition to designed to warn city dwellers of air raid in World War II, they were later used to warn a nuclear attack. For a long time, I associated this sound with Chernobyl as well. I always knew that parenting requires creativity, but I didn't imagine what it means to parent during the work. My another friend shared her, shared her life hack on Facebook. She said she found how to motivate her kids to hide in a bomb shelter. She wrote, I gave them sweets every time they reached out to both children. And I didn't allow them to eat when sweets before the work, but her times required her decision. And these real thoughts are part of the team for what I need to know. A few days ago, my friend Miroslava wrote to me that her son is sleeping up in sleepless night. Finally, she was exhausted. But then she heard the sound of siren. They hear this, this sound from five to 15 times per day, and they weren't affected. yet. So, so she asked me, maybe we could skip this time and do not run to home shelter. While she was thinking about that, the siren stopped, but we both were fine. The war in Ukraine poses an immediate and growing threat to the life and well being of countries of seven and a half million children. On Tuesday, yesterday, six year old girl had died alone from the dehydration in the ruins of her home. After shelling by Russian force, destroyed the building and killed her mother. Statistics are terrifying. And at least 57 kids were killed by Russian in the break. And I have changed this number four times by others preparing this speech. If they were neo Nazi, these 57 kids, innocent soul, I'm sure that we will never forget and never forgive this one. Uh, the number is not complete as Russian troops are not allowed to take bodies and keep medical squads in the occupied city. They are killing civilians who try to escape from occupied cities. And today, Russian missiles have struck the maternity hospital in Mariupol. They are fighting a game with one baby. This is Lovas of Lovas. I must say that I work with words, I'm, I'm a journalist, but in these speeches, when I try to express, express what I feel about what is happening in Ukraine, I can describe this thing. My heart is heavy with full of hope. This war brought up uncombined feelings, make you feel low and then can be super angry. But for sure, I haven't been so proud that I haven't. So far, I'm Ukrainian. Today, Ukraine is fighting, fighting, and standing. And I think we have been thinking too much about like Russian plan, Putin's coup, their tactics, tactics. And now it's high time to think about Ukraine. What is so special about Ukraine? About Ukraine? 
And yesterday, my president said to me, okay, Feldman, we are diplomatic that the same people, despite having to fight one of the biggest army in the world. We have to fight the helicopters, the rockets. We didn't want this war. We didn't want to lose what we have, what is ours, Ukraine. And when I see how many people support Ukraine, how many volunteers we have in Ukraine, how many parents around the world welcome Ukrainian mothers and kids. Every time when I see a little flag in cars and the windows here in the USA, I say to myself that we must be. Because you know, there is, everything is possible when you were born near to a model. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, first of all, I really want to express my great, big, big gratitude to Steve and all colleagues who, is, who organize this event and who's here today to be with us in a very short statement, as, a, as I promised. I just want to stress three main conflict dynamics which are rooted in this conflict. First of all, uh, it's marginalized position of Ukraine as a border state between political, economic, and ideological systems. Both Russia and the West have competed to impose their influence over Ukraine, promoting expansion of NATO or a different form of union with Russian Federation. Uh, however, the West often portrayed Ukraine as weak and corrupted state, and Russia presented Orange Revolution and Maidan as the Western interventions and resulted in NATO leadership, pro-NATO leadership in Ukraine. Uh, this created dynamics of threats, both symbolic and uh, realistic threats that were employed by Russia in justification of current invasion. Second, Putin administration denied the distinct identity of Ukrainian, ascribing them pan-Slavic and even Russian identity and redefining history of reunification of Ukrainian territories as artificial uh, combination of acquired lands. And third, the international community and the US administration did not create strong response to Russian invasion in Georgia in 2008. Moreover, in 2014, Olympic games in Russia were held few miles from occupied territories of Abkhazia and Ossetia in January and shortly after, in February, Russia annexed Crimea and invaded Eastern Ukraine in March with very weak Western sanctions and no serious consequences for the Putin regime. These three dynamics impact the form of the war. It's not a war between two ethnic or national groups, but a violent invasion into the territory of a sovereign neighboring nation. Unable to reach a quick victory and replace the Ukrainian government due to strong resistance of Ukrainian army and people, Putin now employs civilian devastation as a tactic of intimidation. He hopes to, to hope that the suffering of Ukrainian people will influence the government's decision to accept Putin's demands. The result is humanitarian catastrophe. For the Ukrainian people, with cities destroyed and over 2 million people already displaced. More people are impacted in cities, unable to escape where the humanitarian corridors because of ongoing fighting and shelling, or the unwillingness to migrate to Russia as proposed to Putin. Shortage of water, food, medication, as well as safe shelter are affecting millions of people from Ukraine. In addition, trauma that is experienced by the population will have a long-term effect on the nation. Many governments, businesses, uh, organizations, and individuals have stepped in to help the Ukrainian people. And I will be glad to discuss today what can be done to support the brave Ukrainian nation. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, we are opening up for questions and comments uh, from both people in the room as well as people um, online. So, so if people in the room are the better way to go first. Please, yes, I'm sure there are lots of questions that people have, and we, we really intentionally wanted to keep our opening comments very short so that we can hear from you. I was just kind of like the one thing that's interesting to me about this war is like four now, like like years ago, so like what escalated the situation that really escalated quite quickly. So that uh Eric, you want to maybe try to answer that question? Steve, if you could, if you don't mind for me and for Eric, can you repeat all questions because yeah. we could not hear them, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the question is, why now? So obviously they occupied uh, Crimea in 2014. Uh, why now? What's changed that made this happen at this particular moment? Eric, you want to give that a go? I can, yes, I can answer. Yes, certainly I can answer the question. Uh, at least try to answer the question. If you can hear me well, mm, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, as a political psychologist, I should say that an aging politician, person over 70, 75, has acquired already, he or she, a number of uh, traits and features that uh, distinguish him or her from a younger people in power. Putin, uh, for many years was obsessed with the idea of Ukraine for some weird, strange psychological reason. It became personal for him. Uh, yes, his close advisor said uh, several times he was offended a couple of times because he thought Ukraine will join him in, in unison in march and lockstep. Yes, he was disappointed with previous presidents because they were, in his mind, too disobedient compared to Lukashenko in Belarus. Yes, he really thought that Ukrainian people, everybody will be supporting and begging uh, Moscow to <clears throat> take them in their arms and unify with Mother Russia, so to speak. But why now? We think that the people in, who are um, older, who are more mature, <clears throat> they will have sense of uh, time and eternity. No, a psychological research shows that people over 75 has this <clears throat> unusual urgent uh, sense of urgency. A, a very acute sense of urgency. They need to do things now because they understand the shortness of their lives. I will not speculate because we didn't psychologically examine Putin. Probably nobody could and could just be, be alive and say truth about him. Age uh, is a, a, my explanation. And second, uh, he is possible illness, but we don't know about this. But the sense of urgency maybe uh, could have been caused by by uh, these two psychological features, two features of his character, character and his personality. Stephen? For any of the panelists, for any of these questions, anytime you want to jump in, uh, please do. I can I, I can jump qu quickly. I didn't want to start immediately because I just gave the uh, talk. But um, one of the factors which we need to take into account, and Eric showed that there are a lot of personality issues, and I actually wrote about the group think which Putin is uh, applying for his uh, environment. But I think also one of the objective factors was that on January 17, Ukraine and NATO should sign the memorandum for understanding of technical cooperation. And for Putin, it was one more sign that the uh, West is expanding NATO into Ukraine. And for him, it was a great opportunity to use previous narratives of, as you told me, uh, Steve, exactly, of Nazi in Ukraine, of our people, uh, genocide of our people, the Z for saving uh, Donbass. And uh, this uh, cooperation was one of the triggering points, the signing of this memorandum was one of the triggering points for this event. Question. What do you think is the best way to communicate the Russian people? Because uh, you know propaganda and disinformation is at high level, and uh, yeah, what is the best way to reach out to the Russian people? The media, the media environment a little bit. 
Yeah, this is a really tricky question. Um, I can say that not all media has been uh, censored with Russia. Facebook is formally censored, but uh, it's sister like messenger works. Uh, WhatsApp still works. Uh, there is Telegram, which is a very active uh, uh, channel of social media to use um, to both follow events and share information with Russia. Um, of course, the major issue is that the majority of the Russian population doesn't get their news through uh, the internet or any type of social media, but through television. Uh, there is logistically no way to have facts about the war disseminated through Russian state media. Uh, the only way is through alternative sources. Um, I think numbers count for everyone on this. So viewing Russian media that's coming out from Russia through YouTube and other social media channels is really important. Uh, say Rudy Dude's numbers are really important. He's got 30 million views on some of his interviews. He's, a, he's basically a dissident reporter. Uh, he's the only media figure that since March 1st has come out with any uh, stories in which they actually will call the war a war um, with uh, like, uh, Bumi just maybe did an interview with them uh, that was probably pre, pre-war, but it came out after the war and that's got millions of views. So finding out, and you know, Duke gets supported by YouTube, right? So that's the good channel to work with. Uh, I would say uh, Piva Barov is another good resource for Adaxia. Uh, he's towing the line, it's still open. Uh, so watch him and comment, things like that. Solidarity with from the West is really important because Russians are very, very isolated and they cannot speak up. It's illegal for them to do that. So it's on the West to, to support them and to support Ukraine at the same time um, because they are going to be hurt very, very much by this country. So originally I'm from Lithuania and I live in the United States five years and uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know that right now so many Lithuanians fighting for Ukraine and Slava Ukraine and uh, we directly call into Russian people. We have public access numbers and of course we need to know Russian language. But I know my friends they like calling right now and try they try to talk. They don't they just want to spread the news, not to fight them, but to always spread the news. And I believe that it's working. Thank you. I, I think that's, that's really important. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I've certainly been talking about with students in my class is, you know, just what it means to, to limit access to information. And there is information that's available to people, but they have to work really hard to get to it. Right, and there are people who are really good at working with VPNs to get around blocks in the internet and things like this, but every time you put up an additional barrier, I mean, that many more people aren't going to see what's actually happening. Uh, and, you know, it, it takes a real effort and it takes a desire to actually find out that information. We think only, you know, in our own United States context, the number of people who will only get their uh, news information through particular sources and will never change from, from you know, Fox News to something else or, or vice versa, right? Um, and so you have to want these kinds of information. But it's, it's more difficult to get to it now than what it was even just a week ago. Yeah, I've been reading various different um, accounts about the best way to put pressure on Putin, who, from what I've read, is extremely iso isolated physically and psychologically um, from people. 
So, um, and you may differ among yourselves, but I'm just curious, you know, I, I've read about like pressuring the oligarchs by freezing our accounts and stuff, but I've read that, well, they don't really have enough influence on Putin. And these, these mass demonstrations, is Putin even aware of them? I mean, is he just locking them out and just having people arrested? Um, does he care if the economy collapses? I just am very curious in your different opinions, where you think the pressure points are that can most affect Putin and get him to change his mind or backtrack or enter talks or something. Whatever. Yes, yes, Steve. Uh, the oligarchs and uh, Putin made an agreement, uh, an informal, it was uh, sort of an agreement uh, back 20 plus years ago, that you make uh, money, but you uh, don't interfere in politics. It was understood uh, by bo both sides and it was respected by both, both sides. I am very skeptical that oligarchs, so-called oligarchs have enough power today uh, in Russia. They are scared because everything they have, everything they owe can, be well, it's just going up in smoke today because of the sanctions and because of the market is going to crush the market, basically will become worthless. However, they were able to escape and move their capitals and assets uh, and, and hide them in many other, other uh, forms in other countries. So that's why they will be fine, quote unquote. And also, as we know, the uh, US presidency shows that that's, uh, uh, the longer presidents stay in power, the more insulated, more isolated they become. Their associate creates just circles and around them, fortresses protecting them from outside information in our democratic society. Uh, think about Putin, for 20 plus years, he was able to create this multiple uh, enforced system, reinforced system of fortresses around him. And he lives in this small world, but very powerful world and control the system fairly well. He prepared the system. And also he thinks that he prepared the society to withstand, withstand those sanctions. But however, he did not expect that sanctions will be so massive and your support, our support will be so overwhelming all over the world. Uh, and that's, that's probably one of the, uh, one of the things that's not under the straw, but a thing that can break the, the, the well, evil back of, of a regime there. Stephen. Mm -hmm. And if I can, yes, if I, if I can add, let me lower my hand. So I, I completely agree with pressure of sanctions and sharing information, uh, creative ways of sharing information in Russia, but I also want to bring us back to Ukraine. And I think another very important pressure on Putin is Ukrainian resistance, some information which he could not ignore. And his blitz operation, special operation didn't really realize. He already removed the one of his demands to uh, remove Ukrainian government and replace Ukrainian government. Now he only demanding the uh, saying, uh, changing the uh, politic, politics toward NATO and uh, recognition of Crimea uh, as part of Russia and recognition of Donetsk and Lugansk in independent states. So he's already changing his demands because he's seen this pressure of how Ukrainian nation itself, the resilient, I done research three years ago on resilience in, of Ukrainian nation in a situation of a regional war, how they called. And in this uh, situation, we saw volunteerism is the key for resilience and ability of Ukrainian nations deal with its history, dealing with its differences and bring people together. And we see in it more and more creative ways how people responding, but also support of international community. So overwhelming, I think this is where pressure to Putin will be coming from. Unfortunately, it's also come together with suffering of more and more and more people. So it's very hard to really say, oh, this is a great thing because people continue to suffer while he's stuck in Ukraine. But we clearly see that he do not see it anymore as a blitzkrieg and this is a pressure. Some of the online questions. Yeah, let's take one more in the room uh, and then we'll turn to some of the online questions. If you're online, uh, you can put your questions in the QA function uh, on Zoom. Uh, the sanctions, uh, they can uh, be very effective. I asked, what does Russia gain from this war or invasion? 
and uh, one country or countries uh, stand to gain from this conflict. The headline I read uh, today or yesterday is something about Israel could supply gas to Europe, for example. And I'd like to address this question, sort of what, what does Russia get out of this? Um, what about other international players? Nicholas, I know you had some interest in sort of how this impacts the Baltics, the Nordic countries. We can kind of maybe put this on a, a, a broader international. Um, well, I, I have no idea what Russia would get out of it. I'm the last person in this room that would know that from me. So, but, but yeah, I, mean, I, I think we can save the discussion for, for, for all your for your implications, maybe, okay. maybe uh, towards the end. Sure. I think it's not as great as the reason for the question. Okay. I mean, to dodge your question, but uh, since Matthew wants to answer. Uh, I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have uh, some, obviously, Putin has uh, certain visions of Russia and he does have some support for, for that in, in Russia. Uh, and it's a imperialist um, and Soviet constitution. Uh, so that's what he thinks that he has to gain. It's, it's, he gains status. I think it's clear that that's not possible. Uh, and I think it's probably becoming clear to him that it's not possible. Um, and that puts him in a very difficult position and a very dangerous position for everyone. Um, because it's not just imperial expand, territorial expansion, but uh, reconstitution of a nuclear based bifurcation of the world. Um, you know, we've never really, you know, since the missile crisis, heard about a leader, you know, other than from North Korea threatening to, you know, go nuclear. And that threat is a big globe divider. Um, I don't know that it will have traction, but it, it keeps Russia as a global power, um, and, and, and that helps Putin inside Russia. So that that's what I think he has to gain: keeping power inside Russia, uh, and then creating a kind of another new set of, kind of evil partners who are willing to go nuclear. It's not that right. It's very off balance. Lost. Yeah. Lost is much bigger. Right. And, uh, but it's dangerous right now. Because it's off balance, it's in a corner. So that's the big fear that people can scrap here and get You know, I'm certainly no political scientist, but I read them. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the interesting things in the lead up to this war is that so many of those political scientists who believe that international, uh, uh, you know, that, that nations, um, you know, uh, operate on interests. Right, those who uh, promote the notions of reality, these are all the people who told us this wasn't going to happen. Right, and and you know I think the answer is that you know is there something for them to get for for Russia to get out of this, for Putin to get out of this? You know, in sort of material interest, it doesn't seem like much. Right, it certainly doesn't seem like it's worth the risk. Um, and so I think we have to take vision seriously in the way that he talked. And you know. I've been scared about this since last July when he publishes this historical article that says basically Ukraine doesn't exist, Ukrainians don't exist. It's all this like made up, you know, gift of Russian czars. It's all created by these outside influences. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's horrible history, right? Um, I mean, I'm a history professor and, and you know, he would fail my class uh, if you were to say it like this, right? Um, but it's this complete denial of the notion that Ukrainians can't exist, that they do exist, and that they have the right to have their own state. And there is this tie that he's made that, in, in some ways, what we can find in historical memory since World War II. Right? During World War II, Ukrainians fought very fiercely uh, against the Nazis, sometimes with the Nazis, against the Soviets, but fighting for 
their notion of what Ukraine should be, right? Their idea of a Ukrainian state. Um, but in, in the mind of many, and I think in, in Putin's mind and the mind of many who came up in the Soviet education system, right, there was this tie between Ukrainian nationalism and Nazism that goes back to the war. It's, it's a, I mean, it's terrible history, but I think it's just so deeply ingrained there, this notion that Ukrainian nationalism equals Nazism. And Nazism, right, I mean, when he, when he uses this term Nazi all the time, right, this is in his way dehumanizing his enemy, right? Who are Nazis? Nazis are those that we should fight against without pity. Um, and so it seems to me, and, and you know, I've, I've become increasingly convinced of this over time, and I've you know, been teaching about Putin basically my entire professional life uh, at this point, um, and trying to make sense of him for my history classes, and I'm increasingly coming to this point of view that this is a man who believes that there is one Russian people that is made up of three parts, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and the Ukrainians. Uh, and, and he doesn't see them as, as separate groups that deserve their own independence. Um, but you, can you give us a question off the, the internet? Uh, yes, can you hear me? All right, so there are several questions. Some of them have been kind of answered, you know, in, in the course of the discussion. Um, and um, there are at least two groups of questions that we have. One is about the immediate goals and possible off-ramps for Putin and for all the players involved. And uh, there are also a couple of questions about the long-term implications and also what can we do? So I will start with the near term and then maybe I'll read all those questions and then maybe we can move on to the, uh, to the other ones. So, uh, uh, Carolyn Horton is asking, uh, what you all ultimately see as, as being Putin's off-ramp uh, to ending this war, especially as he has already changed the demands, backing down to just wanting Ukraine permanently out of NATO and the EU, etc. Another question, uh, Melissa, Smirsh. Uh, in introductory comments made by a few panel, uh, panel members, Putin's version of the historical origin of Ukrainians and Russians, specifically that Ukrainians are Russians, were mentioned. Could you summarize other versions of the origins of these people uh, that are supported by historical documents or records? Sean Peregranov. How do we think the Kremlin's expectations for the war compare to how it has gone so far? And maybe one more. Um, what is the end goal of Putin and will he possibly invade another country, for example, Finland or Moldova? Okay, lots of questions there. Um, for the last one, by the way, I would say, um, there's no way he's invading another country anytime soon. He can't even handle invading this one. Um, so I don't see how he's going to have the, the, the capacity to do that. Not to say that he wouldn't want to, although, uh, you know, I didn't even ask questions about that. But they're really theoretical questions at this point. It's not going to happen. Anybody else? Uh, can, I, can I add something to that? Yeah. So, I think that. I think two weeks ago, the Swedish Prime Minister uh, gave a talk justifying why Sweden is sending military, uh, military equipment to a country at war for the first time since 1939. And, and she said that uh, if we accept Putin's argument that there are parts of Europe that we can replace under some sort of misbegotten sense of Tsarist sort of Russia or something, which in fact is what they're saying to Ukraine. If, we, if the rest of the world can let, let him get away with it, then we can accept its argument. And then there's nothing in the next level, is if, if ignoring logistics in the department of science. Nothing stopping you from making the same argument against Estonia, against Lithuania. Those are NATO members. Or against Finland, which is the part of Russia. And, and Finland is not a NATO member, but Finland has the defense pact with Sweden and Norway, and, and Norway is a NATO member. Um, the Treaty of Lisbon uh, also requires EU members to come to each other's defense. So, you know, I think you're right. And the, the military picture probably does not mean another, you know, another country being targeted, but, but the, the potential is it, it's quite unmistakable and quite scary. 
I might add here, I uh, completely agree, it's, it's potential which is important, right? And conflict dynamics, threats, it's something which we attribute to people and which uh, influence how we behave toward others. And we can actually see already results on complete polarization of Georgian society right now about uh, statements which were made by Georgian government about not joining sanctions uh, and polarization about going to war with Russia or being even engaged in uh, fighting in Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, we see that many people like in Georgia or Moldova who live through the war, they, they experience post-traumatic uh, post-traumatic experiences which they they have now a lot of people start packing their luggage or something because they 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 had they live through the war they live through invasion so it does have a very significant effect on all neighboring countries uh, of Ukraine and Russia at the same time uh, and another very important implication short-term implication which we can see there is uh, the developing of a very strong unification of Ukrainian nation, but at the same time, unfortunately, we start seeing very uh, negative views on uh, Russian Russians. I I really want to say stress that it's not among everyone. A lot of people understand that Putin, it's uh Putin government is an uh, army which were trained and brainwashed. But at the same time, as we just discussed before the seminar, a lot of my Ukrainian friends who never were engaged in any uh, politics start sending uh, messages to their Russian friends, showing pictures of bombing, of devastation, of killed people. And all they told me is they're receiving back, it's lie, it's fake. It's not really happening. So it does really impact now relationship across families, across uh, friends between Russia and Ukraine. So a lot of work have to be done in the future to restore relationship between people. Just to follow up on that. Um, we, we saw disinformation campaigns really, really ratchet up in 2014, and that directly affected, there's a global disinformation campaign that directly affected American elections. It rides on a wave of the rise of nationalism that includes the United States. And we see this, this line of saying, real news is fake, is an echo, of things that we as American citizens heard Donald Trump saying many times, and he's convinced a large part of our population that he's right. So you can put yourself in, in the Russian shoes in that way, and you have a stronger leader and a bigger part of the population who will agree with him. And so it just undermines uh, just back oriented. Uh, journalism uh, and essentially undermines free democracy. So it's a, it's, it's a war against free democracy. Um, and, and that war is not just being waged in Ukraine, but all over the world. And you know, we've, we've seen how that information war is waged here. Um, so in a way, it's a global conflict. Uh, totalitarian information against democratic free back based information. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I'm just curious what anybody else is coming from. So we had this image of Russia before this all started, but they have mastered social media, right? They've won the game. They, they had all the bots, they were the ones that, you know, feeding the disinformation. In the United States, you know, in the 2016 election, in uh, the, the Brexit vote, right, all these things. And yet now it seems like they got their butts kicked in this information warfare thing, right? All of a sudden, everybody's on Ukraine's side, but nobody's believing the, the Russian media. 
So, so what happened? How did there? I mean, I, I don't. I've been trying to find somebody who will explain this to me. All the things that I've been reading, but how, what, where did they say it? I, I think it's there. Are, there are active campaigns against this information. Um, that we saw that with how Biden rolled out you know, good information on uh, uh, troop mobilization. Uh, so I think that's one, one strategy. I think there are people in democracies that are attuned to the fact that there is um, bad information out there and they need to seek out good information. Um, but the issue, I, I, you know, go back to that this war and many of Putin's actions are for him, for him to resolve internal problems. And so he's got this big part of the population hooked on these narratives and he can't lose that. So the information war is really against Ukrainians and against Russia. Um, and against certain Americans. Please, Eric, go ahead. Yes, uh, Stephen, you know better than anybody else that we can learn from history. Take two wars, uh, US uh, uh, in Korea and in Vietnam. Uh, the war in Korea was known as, a, well, the unknown war because very few Americans were interested in the war. New York Times would publish daily reports on page four about the war in Korea. It took about two and a half years before American public opinion began to realize and vote in, against uh, against the war. We're in Vietnam. We learned about the body bag syndrome, but not only until 1968, 1,000 Americans died. I'm not saying that will take years in Russia, but, but it is just the, the, the understanding of a devastation of the war. The body bags, well, coming, coming from Ukraine there, giving, giving mothers, that can uh, ch change the tide. However, in a very short statement, very short, that's all those talks about whether Ukraine is an ethnic group or nation, nation, uh, Soviet Union, global domination. Uh, I think the only means to achieve Putin's main goal is a personal goal. Vladimir Putin is fighting World War II again, his obsession with winning that war, with a, with a changing minds of, of Russian people, with passing the law, which considered an insult to, to just question the role of, of Stalin in, in, in World War II. So Putin is fighting that war. It's a personal for him. And again, all the talks about reason and, and uh, uh, balancing and power interest in the Soviet Union, it just, it's just secondary. To him, this is personal stuff. The only devastation, unfortunately, of the country, the, the economy, the people in Russia, and pressure of the West. Thank you, Karina, mentioned rightly so. We, we must say that uh, the fighting of Ukrainian people, those things just uh, probably can, can turn the tide and as soon as possible. Thank you. Does anybody want to try to address the question of that about all points? <laughs> Is there a way out of this war for him? Can he back off? Will he ever back off? If I may, uh, uh, well, uh, it's, a, it's a known trick in politics. Stop the war, declare victory, come back home. And at least it is what he can do and just and celebrates victory in, in Russia. And I believe many people, if not most, will consider this a victory. But this is exactly probably what stopped the war right now. That's the only hope at least I have this 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 time. Eric, you, you just really took it from, <laughs> from your mouth. It's exactly how you construct the victory, right? How you define yeah. the meaning yeah. of it for you for your people. And if you're already ready to remove several key demands about replacing government and going into this, it might be some way for him to just uh, find some narrative which will suit him in a way. Uh, at the same time, the dignity of Ukrainian people uh, to show in that we won actually can be in this situation problematic. So I think the negotiation really have to be in a way to give him way out to save civilians, but at the same time, not to sacrifice the key values for Ukrainian nation. Yeah. 
was full of snap brush. Um, so I think you have to do uh, a few more as well. Ukraine and also Russia. Uh, you're right that propaganda is uh, Russia is this one. So uh, my own problem is the city of Belgorod, which is on the border. Uh, so I have my uh, family there. And I have fights with them during like um, nine years or something like that. Uh, talking to them, trying to persuade them uh, that they are listening to lies. Uh, I used a lot of strategies, uh, polite ones, non polite ones, but they still do not believe. So their strategy is more like uh, I ignore that, it's somewhere outside of my agenda, probably, actually, of course. But the city of Kharkov. Which is under the home now, it's like 50 kilometers from my hometown. And right now, they're witnessing how the uh, missiles from my hometown or close to my hometown are going directly to Kharkov. Kharkov, where I've been to like several times, um, to the city where I walk with my friends. Um, I'm a sociologist, uh, part of a sociologist. And there were some uh, videos. Or where the faculty of sociology is required. Um, so, my question is how am I supposed to talk with my own relatives if they don't even believe me? Uh, like, I'm in close relationship with them, right? So, I'm kind of a, a traitor, obviously, uh, but they always say that in a wrong way. But in my opinion, it, it is very close to, to that definition, actually. So, the question is you said, like, we need to call people to uh, tell them. What is going on? But the thing is, like I share with them, share with them links, groups, borders, everything, and they just do not like they like they don't have any uh, I don't know memory or something. They just no. It's outside of, of my of our agenda. So the question is, how should Russians talk to their relatives who support uh, Putin and his government? That's a difficult question. Um, I think we are just kind of wobbling when we go in the shoulder. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't um, you know, personally have any um, advice uh, for that. that, that um, but I can give sort of an explanation uh, why it's happening and how it's happening. Uh, so it's be the older generation, the generation that are, um, and I was talking to Mr. Rumble earlier about that, uh, they are the um, post-Cold War, um, the people of Soviet Union generation. So for them, Putin um, is more of a savior from that situation than anything else. And um, they see him as someone who actually brought, you know, Russia from the dirt and, you know, how all those people sort of have a normal life after the Soviet Union war. There's another parallel that goes to that is that um, uh, Russian propaganda is an extremely sophisticated um, and I don't know if we're ever watching one or you know, any of these kind of related to that. Uh, the propaganda is really sophisticated, it's done in a very subtle way. And for many, many years, this, what is called Russian hatred, that in a way is more of a national than anything, um, was, had been cultivated in. So that Russians would take pride in you know, what they achieve and who they are and the heritage that they're coming from. So what I have noticed personally that even the people that realize what's going on, um, they want to take the position of being this ultimate Russian patriot who is going to stand behind the country, their country, behind their president, no matter what. So basically, it's line line. Uh, and that's, you know, part, it's a result of that awesomely 
uh, created propaganda machine that can literally brainwash them here. Um, my question to your question is even, I would say, even more complicated. How do you change mind of the Russian people on this issue actually live? That for me is a real dilemma, personal dilemma. Um, and just it, it blows my mind because here we have all the means of information available to us. We are not you know, one of the bulk of the in the middle of nowhere where Channel One is the only thing that they can watch. So, how do we deal with people that live in this country? And still support uh, what's going on. That I just want to add to the question. So I could understand those living there, sort of understand. Not understand, I can see where it's coming from. But what really blows my mind when I hear um, support or point to people who are hiding, at least in my opinion, I don't get hurt, uh, who don't live in the where they get all the ones in private communities. So that, I think that is, uh, to me, it's really concerning. It's really important. Uh, Steve, if I may, um, I want to address the issue of how, how you talk to people. And I completely agree with all dynamics of uh, which were employed by the war, including projection, attribution, narrow, cognitive dissonance, and all of this was there involved. But the main question, what do we do? And uh, this is the field which our school is basically trying to address. Uh, you do not speak to people about what, who's right, who's wrong. This is the real wrong approach. You start with very small common ground. You start with a very small trust building. And it could be about discussion of the suffering because war brings suffering to both sides. And a lot of mothers, a lot of families in Russia now will send their sons and they don't know what's going on with it. You see the reports of Russians not knowing what to do with their bodies, right? And a lot of people, mothers don't even have idea where their sons are. And suffering of uh, especially about all the generations who are probably more brainwashed by Putin, their remembering of the suffering during World War II, this is something which you can bring together. Small stories. So what happens to your family, what happens to this family? And this is, for example, how we were working with OSCE on the line of contact um, between Donetsk and Donbass. Asking person as a story, asking if person interested to hear a story of the other person, giving the story. And one by one, we will build a community of people who were able to engage. So there are very step by step, but finding compassion, finding empathy as a way to engage and help each other. This is where we, you start. Thank you, Karina. Um, but then why don't we take a couple more questions uh, online? Yes, we have uh, quite, a, quite a number of questions that have come in. Again, some of them have been uh, directly or indirectly answered by our panelists. Uh, I wanted just to uh, mention Francesca and Paul, they are tackling the same issue from two different sides. Uh, Francesca is asking what the Russian society can do uh, given the situation in Russia now. And Paul, uh, I will read Paul's question. Um, I'm an American student of Russian. I often feel as though there is an emphasis placed on the offensive use of the Russian language here in the United States. How can Russian language students of my generation contribute to more peaceful relations between our societies? How can we help to peacefully prevent future conflicts like the one in Ukraine? And I think uh, I would add, you know, on, on my own behalf to what Paul is uh, saying is essentially uh, how do we deal with the Russophobia that inevitably has emerged uh, in the Western societies and in, in American society as well? Because this is an issue for a democratic society, uh, just as it is in Russia. Uh, um, 
I, I think um, they're probably students. Uh, two, two aspects. One, one is really knowing the facts, um, and I. And then the other is, is what Karina was mentioning about how to talk to people without getting into conflict with them, uh, just keeping the conversation going. Um, but if you don't know the facts, then you are just as easily can get taken in by, uh, by someone uh, on the other side. And, uh, and I, I, I think that Democracy is is based on, on freedom of speech, um, but I think that global democracies changed in World War II around genocide, and I uh, and and democracies came to to defend human rights. So that puts us in a little bit of an ideological line um, because we have to, it makes us, it makes it that a free democracy in some ways should also be committed to power and not just freedom of speech. Uh, so how to wrestle with that, I think it's, it's really uh, a question for every one of us. Um, how do we both adhere to facts and reality, and also uh, also fight for peace? Um, this is really at the core of the issue in Um I, I don't know how many of you have researched a uh, number of civilian casualties in Dunham. Anybody know who does specialist? There are many, many civilian casualties in the thousands, three, five thousand. Uh, there are also sorry, well, total deaths, right? But just civilians who are not uh, separatists or Ukrainian army. Uh, so this is an issue, right? Where we don't know, we can't say exactly what the conflict is about. I mean, the large part is over these. Civilian deaths. Um, so he's he's using the democracy playbook against us, and in some ways, it's it's just a, a kind of inability to get down to the basic information, to be able to share it. Uh, that 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 gets in the way of communication oftentimes. It's on both sides, um, but it's it's really difficult in our time of you know we call it post truth whatever, but that we can't accept that. There's not a post truth world. You know, there are facts and there are lies. Um, and it's worth fighting for the facts. Because if you don't get them, you know, they, they'll be used to something that's used again. Okay. Would you just uh, elaborate what went on here? I don't know why there's this big difference in your numbers. I don't understand. No, I think the numbers are the same. I, I think we're just. She said 14,000. So that's the total number of deaths in Donbass from 2000. But Putin's saying that uh, Ukrainians are killing Russians? Uh, there, in 2014, after my dad, uh, Donbass, there were separatists, Ukrainian nationalists, separatists in Donbass and Ukraine. They, they declared independence. They were backed by Russia, armed by Russia. And there was a war that started there where there were many casualties on both sides. The total number of casualties that are listed are, are around 15,000, 14,000, 13,000. The total number of casualties. But that includes Russian military casualties. It includes 
pro Russian Ukrainian nationalist separatist casualties, and it includes Ukrainian state army casualties, and it includes civilian casualties who were just caught in the war. And Putin is calling the civilian casualties genocide. But it's a, it's a play with words because it's not technically genocide by any standard. Does that make sense? Oh, one minute. Uh, if I if I may, can I uh, just add the about conflict resolution question uh, about how we deal with growing negativity and the Russophobia, Russophobia in um, we have to address the dynamics of intergroup conflict and it includes generalization of the other side, it includes dehumanization of other side, it includes collective axiology which brings all positive things on other side and all negative uh, on the other side, like evil, perception of the global evil on the other side. And how to deal with it, there are a lot of ways uh, just to bring some of them. First of all, it's really need to separate perpetrators of violence from the other people. We also have to recognize that majority of Russians who even, if we hear from newspapers, or oh, 45%, 52% of Russians support war, we, of course, it's extremely disturbing. But at the same time, they, as we discussed, they're victims of the, of the propaganda war. They probably don't have any other ideas. We just discuss how it's happening. So separating people and also showing examples of brave Russians who actually go for anti-war demonstrations, who are arrested. Examples of multiple Russians who are, there is a dialogue, Russian uh, American um, women dialogue, which stay, uh, produce a very good statement. So a lot of people are now in the front line, Russian people in the front line of uh, support for Ukrainians. Not a lot of them, but they are. So showing this people, showing this determination and uh, separating governments and separating regimes from the people, it's a very, very important uh, what done in, in the history of other post-war reconstruction and reconciliation. And just one more thing, I'm sorry, Eric, just one phrase. Uh, reconciliation never starts after the conflict. Reconciliation should start in the very heart of the conflict, during the most important violence, but very brave people, very brave, what we call them, insider reconcilers. Only then conflict can be finished. Thank you. Sorry, Eric, I just really wanted to stress it. Thank you. You said brilliantly. But a short, short addition, very short, that uh, we should distinguish between uh, immediate emotions and sometimes knee-jerk reactions and long-term phobia, which uh, can, can be settled and be, be permanent or, or last for, 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 for generations. And, uh, and there are certain things that reflect our values and sometimes, uh, well, good and bad taste will be absurd. Think about in 1940 to organize concert Richard Wagner in London. Uh, it will be absurd to uh, organize Kabuki theater in Boston after Pearl Harbor. So it's not about Japanese culture, so it, it's, a, it's, it's not the right moment. And I don't think people will suggest that, well, that Tchaikovsky, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, out, out, so we don't need them anymore. No, it's, 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 it's a Russian culture, it's one thing. And the other thing is our emotional response today uh, and our, our resolve and kind of thank you so much and just we stand together and this is what's most important and and younger people in fact i think have more chances to overcome those fears and prejudices compared to older generations in all due respect to, to us Russian and Russian and the microphone, sorry. But maybe we have been talking about it too long. As I said, Steve died in Ukraine. And maybe we could talk about 
farming front line of propaganda later. And there is no peaceful resolution of this problem because there is already war in Ukraine. And we have so many victims of this war. I mean, I can understand that people in Russia are suffering now, but please do not make a competition between us in this situation. And maybe um, when we are talking about US and Russian rules in this um, propaganda war, we actually didn't uh, try to, to play in propaganda. I think we have different values. And of course, our values win. You know? I have no um, I have no idea if I have to speak with Russian people about the war in Ukraine now because I'm speechless about what is happening. There, is, there are no words to, to explain what that means when uh, Russian troops come to Ukraine and fight uh, our hospital, our pregnant women. So, I know we've got a lot, and we're, we're completely running well on time. We tried to, to you know, do as much in terms of QA and the session as we could, and we're still kind of stuck some of these Well, the question was about sort of who controls what uh, what's going to become of Eastern Europe uh, and things like that. I'm going to go ahead and collect a couple more questions here in the room, uh, and then we'll we'll give folks who want to respond one last chance. I know we're running out of time, um, and uh, you know these conversations are going to have to continue on. Uh, I think there's there's nothing else that we can do. Thank you. Um, my name is Dan. Uh, I had a question about I know one of the speakers there. Mentioned earlier about uh, what non governmental organizations can be doing to provide humanitarian aid to Ukrainian refugees and to people currently in Ukraine. Um, I was wondering how, because there's been a lot of talk about military aid, about sending guns, about sending them to the places, but what can we do to send food, you know, a bottle of water, to send tents for people, uh, blankets, you know, for the cold? Uh, what can we do to support Ukrainian refugees in other countries like Poland and uh, Romania? So I'd like to know a little bit about how you can approach that. 
let's take one more and then we'll look. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, like, to what extent is this conflict and not solving the interstate conflicts is like the best class on that interstate conflict? So if that's resolved, then then it's the best. I mean, it's not a strong event that it is, but if that technically um, ends with loss. I just wanted to add on to uh, the future of Putin and there's been a lot of things said today about uh, how he's maybe acting on you know, public interest. Uh, the other day, the uh, former Ukrainian president said that he was crazy. Um, there's a lot of different things out there. So his actions that he's taken now, um, we see that affecting future relations with in this case, uh, U.S. leadership or presidency meeting with him. Um, and what can we see with the trust either being built up later or is it diminished? Well, as I walk my group, um, let me just um, say, keep showing support, right? Anytime we can. Let our Ukrainian friends know uh, how much they matter to us. Keep donating. The NGOs that are trying to provide support um, for people who are suffering. Um, if you uh, are on Twitter, um, look for something like Tim, Timothy Snyder, who has uh, collected a lot of uh, sources, uh, places that you can, can provide financial support to, which can, can really make a difference. Uh, and I'll turn it over to the panelists if anybody would like to address any of these last questions. I know you are on that Twitter. Okay. By rights, privilege to be in the Hague and working like that. He's committing war crimes. I, I close my eyes often and I just imagine that I'm in the room and I can see the look on Putin's face when he's arrested for war crimes. I mean, it's not going to happen. But, I you know. know. There are currently ongoing, there's been ongoing in fact, criminal court investigations since 2014. The historian can dream and look, put him in a cell with a bunch of war crimes. Yeah, I mean, he should be like, right to the democracy there. Right? Yeah. Very tough. Anything any of the panelists would like to add? If I, if I may also quickly to answer, uh, I think we really have to concentrate what's going I know I know there are a lot of discussion of geopolitics of Putin, but I think it's very important for us to concentrate what's going on in Ukraine and what effect this war has on Ukraine and continue putting attention to it and see what can be done in the short term and in the, in the long term. In the short term, we see a lot of uh, arms um, support in Ukraine, unfortunately, not connected to the no-fly zone still and no flights, but NATO have its own reason and prevention of bigger war, um, which we can support or not support. And what is, I think, important, what we can uh, do uh, is start thinking about trauma healing, because trauma is so important. A lot of my colleagues um, in Kharkiv, for example, one of my colleagues, she was sitting with her son in an unfinished basement for five days. Just the picture, she said, co completely bombed all the time. Uh, she was able to escape thanks to uh, some efforts which we put together, I hope, but also her Finla uh, Finnish uh, colleagues put together. And now she's telling me that she could not sleep, even she is escaped and she is in safety. She could not sleep because she feels about all these people who left behind and she feel guilt. This is a part of the trauma, right? D deep, deep trauma. And what we saw about all research on trauma, trauma reduced ability of people to respond effectively and to be effective in every aspect of their life. So I think one of the key, what we will see in, in, in coming up, it's trauma 
caring for refugees, uh, if it's possible, within non-occupied part of Ukraine. And we have to deal with education of youth because youth is mostly affected by it and helping them not to, to understand what's going on and why it's going on. on. Exactly as Eric told, deal with these immediate emotions and trying to find ways how to support this young generation of Ukrainians is very, very important. Again, but I do not, speaking about this as a conflict resolution person, I in no way I diminish the importance of sanctions, importance of military support for Ukrainian military and think in some creative way also to reduce civilian causality if, if no fly zone is not an option. So let me just take this opportunity to thank all the panelists. Thank everybody who came. Thank you for all the questions, all the questions we didn't get to our home. Uh, I think that shows how much we need to keep talking about this. We need to keep thinking about it. We need not, not to get tired of it, which I'm really afraid that the American public, public will just grow tired of it. Uh, and the Ukrainian people don't have the option to grow tired of it. So we have to keep talking about it. Um, please uh, join Karina tomorrow morning at 11 uh, with her online Zoom session. You can find links to it uh, through the Bird Mason website just by doing a little hunting. Uh, RussianStudies.gmu.eu have a link to it. Um, so please just continue the conversation and thank you, everybody. Thank you.